more difficult to grow. Contrary to often repeated claims that today's genetically engineered crops have and are reducing pesticide use, the spread of glyphosate-resistant weeds and herbicide-resistant weed management system has brought about a substantial increase or substantial increases in the number and volume of herbicides applied. If new genetically engineered forms of corn and soybean tolerant to 2,4-D are approved, the volume of 2,4-D sprayed could drive herbicide uses up, upward of approximately another 50%. Gang, we're, we're driving this whole thing forward. And you have to ask yourself, Silent Spring, was it totally off? Was she totally off and saying DDT had a problem and the eggs uh, were not you know, getting solid enough and we were having problems with birds and we we're having problems with insects and everything? Well, this is a cry right now all over the media, folks, saying, look, we have super weeds, we have resistant bugs, and we have a tremendous increase of chemical use. This is brilliant for the bottom line of the chemical companies. Yay for you, Dow, Bayer, Syngenta, Monsanto, Dow. You know, come on, good for you, DuPont. But the, the rest of us who are having to deal with the herbicides wiping out some of the natural habitat for the monarch butterfly, for example, now being associated with that, or the fact that, you know, when they're planting some of these genetically modified non-organic corn varieties, they'll spray the neonic pesticides They'll treat the actual corn seed with pesticide, and there'll be pesticide residue in the pollen. So if that gets into some bees, it can change their migration patterns. So life is very complex. Nature is very complex. There are a lot of interactive components. And to assume we have them all under control? Ugh. Please. Yeah, we're giving ourselves a little bit more credit than, than we have due to us. So here's Don Huber, my buddy. He's amazing. He's a plant pathologist from Purdue University. He was a retired colonel from the United States military, and he's done a lot of work on biotechnological warfare, agricultural issues, and he's an expert in some of these chemicals. And if you ever talk to Don, he's up in arms. He's going down to South America where they're using a lot more Roundup now in the Midwest, where he's saying, look, a lot of these diseases, these pathological problems that we're having in the crops are due to the use of genetic modification and Roundup or glyphosate, the active ingredient glyphosate now because it's not patented as Roundup. He'll honestly, he'll say, this is what's happening. I have a couple interviews with him. I'll have to put him online. Amazing. We're finding it in the urine of non-agricultural workers. We're finding it in the air. We're finding it in the water. We're finding it in the rain because it's used so much. Here in the Northwest, they'll do a clear cut and then they'll spray the herbicide down to keep the trees from growing. The sides of the highway, they'll spray herbicide to keep the weeds from growing over the highway. Railroad tracks, they'll spray herbicide. It's used everywhere. So it's a known chelator, manganese, iodine, B12, cobalt. Um, and we're seeing, he's seeing in some of the vets across the U.S., there's this B12 insufficiency that they're identifying in some of the animals. So why? If it's a mineral chelator, you know it was originally originally used to clean out the inside of like pipes because it bound to minerals so tightly you could clean a pipe and suck all the excess minerals out and then they ended up using it as an herbicide but holy smokes it binds the minerals that tightly and it makes them not available to the plants so if you're binding to cobalt what specific nutrient do we know that has cobalt in it in the center of that very large molecule called cyanocobalamin B12. So that's why when you see B12, you can think mineral chelation, cobalt, and it kind of makes the B12 unavailable. So it's also a potent antibiotic. We already discussed that. And it says it wipes out, he says, it wipes out many of the beneficial species, leaving some of the pathogens behind, specifically the Clostridial perfingens and Clostridial botulinum class. So we'll get into that a little bit. But look at Wikipedia. Go to some of the industry pages. I didn't want to take screenshots and give them credit for that because uh, I'll probably get sued by them. Um, these Wikipedia pages, come on, look at this. Glyphosate's mode of action is to inhibit an enzyme involved in the synthesis of aromatic amino acids, tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. Okay, we have an entire class that looks at depression, that looks at mood behavioral disorders, that looks at chemical associated um, uh, influences. So there's, there's more to be discussed on this. I'll give a brief little interplay with this and say, look at this. If you, it's way too complicated. The, the little diamond, the pink diamond is manganese. 
When you inhibit manganese, you stop the shikimic pathway from happening. And when you stop, this is, by the way, Don Huber slide. When you stop that shikimic pathway from happening, look at, you cannot make phenolics. We're hearing in the news every day about these beneficial phenolic compounds found in wine or found in onions or found in berries, whatever it is. Phenolic compounds are at the essence of gene communication from plants. If you cut out this specific enzyme in a plant, you will change the downstream byproducts of that enzyme. Included in that are tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. What's the significance of that? What is the significance? The reality is, since 1994 to recently, we've seen a drastic jump in depression, anxiety, atypical bipolar disorder, the use of antidepressant medications. What are these antidepressant medications primarily used for? Benzos, SSRIs, what are they used for? What specific neurotransmitter pathways are affected by the medications? Could it be the serotonergic pathway? Could it be the dopaminergic pathway? Could it be you're looking at things like serotonin and melatonin for regulating mood and sleep? Could it be that you're looking at things like dopamine for regulating mood? Oh my goodness. These are the precursors for this serotonin and melatonin. And if you look at this specific article, it's, it's quite vast in its, its uh, discussion, but I highly recommend you check it out. Entropy, glyphosate suppression of cytochrome P450 enzymes. I'm gonna jump away from that specific topic and say buried in it is a ton of stuff. And it mentions all the different ways that Roundup or glyphosate, the active ingredient, can alter tryptophan metabolism. So if you're altering tryptophan metabolism, then you might not get your tryptophan to where you need it, which is that feel-good neurotransmitter serotonin, which is that sleep-modulating neurotransmitter melatonin. So is it a possibility that the drastic increase, multiple, it's multiple thousands percentage increase of this herbicide could be causing a change in available neuro transmitter precursors? That's a question I need to ask that I have to see studies for. I'm, I'm shocked no one else is demanding this right now. It's ridiculous. If you go to the website of, of these chemical companies, if you go to Wikipedia, it says this works by inhibiting the enzyme that produces aromatic amino acids. Okay, so where are the studies showing how many actual aromatic amino acids are available in the animals that are consuming these crops. And I wanna see independent scientists, uh, scientists. I don't wanna see industry science. And I wanna see what's happening there. And I wanna see how many of you in my class, when we go on to discussions and Q&A, are opening up your tests and saying, yes, I have clients who have done plasma amino acids, and look at this, holy smokes, just like you, Tom, I'm seeing people with insufficient tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. Man, two of the most efficacious, if that's even a word, the most effective <laughs> treatments that are, we're seeing actually like quickly in clinical practice these days are probiotics and amino acids. These specific amino acids and probiotics that I'll talk to you about in the course, man, you can, you can notice differences in a few days, if not a few hours in some people. It's amazing. So this is something that needs to be checked in to more. Why? Because tryptophan is already the least common amino acid, 1 to 1.5 grams per day. Most people are deficient in it. If you're deficient in B3, which is niacin, you will rob your body of 60 milligrams of tryptophan to make one milligram of niacin. Only 1% makes it to the brain. Once it makes it to the brain, it competes with branch chain amino acids. So you have an issue there. Isoleucine, leucine, valine, as well as phenylalanine and tyrosine. So you have these, well, the phenylalanine and tyrosine are aromatic, not branching, but there's this competition with other amino acids for the blood-brain barrier transport, which we'll see. And then if you're deficient in B6, you don't always metabolize it. What's, all these slides, ignore them. Big picture is tryptophan is tough. When things are awesome, when things are working out beautifully, it's tough to get to the central nervous system. It's tough to get it converted to the actual serotonin and melatonin. So any strike against it is dangerous. 
Could that be an explanation why we're having a decrease? That's one of many. During the course, I'll also talk about how oxidative stress inhibits the primary cofactor of tetrahydrobiopterin, which is BH4. We'll get there. Don't worry about it. Just look at this path, though, to show you where tryptophan goes, to show you where phenylalanine goes. Start getting yourself familiar, because as the course progresses, we're going to dive into this more, more greatly, and you're going to see amazing protocols that will alter a lot of different health issues. So here we are. Well, at least they have in the case studies that I will present. So here we are with the effect of residual drift of glyphosate and the nutrient uptake translocation of plants. You can see the root uptake is challenged and the translocation to the shoot is challenged in iron, manganese, zinc. Anybody seeing zinc insufficiencies out there these days? Here we are looking at alfalfa nutrients with glyphosate. We're seeing sulfur, 52% reduction, sulfur. 52%. So why is that important? You need the sulfur-based enzymes, excuse me, sulfur-based amino acids, cysteine, methionine, and you need sulfur itself for sulfation in detoxification. Wow, we have an entire class on that. It's brilliant, and I'll show you specific foods that can change that, but it's, it's super fun. So soybean nodule formation. If you don't have beneficial species in the soil, and you're using Roundup that kills beneficial species, could you alter then the form of the nodules in the plants that absorb minerals from the soil? Yes, absolutely. So do you know how this works? Let's talk about the relationship. Number one, you chelate the minerals. You make the immune systems weak. Number two, you change the organisms in the soil. And when you change the organisms, you knock out the beneficials and the pathogens flourish, then the plant Basically, according to Dr. Don Huber, the plant gets a case of AIDS. He says, you, you know, you, this is what glyphosate is. It's AIDS for a plant. You knock out the immune system, and all of a sudden it gets sick by everything. But the genetic modification, he says, only partially keeps it alive. It doesn't necessarily keep it healthy. So if you look on the left, glyphosate and sterile soy won't kill the plant. Glyphosate and field soil with pathogenic organisms will and then no glyphosate control. So you can see a difference. You need the three steps. You need the weak immune system, you need the pathogenic organisms, and then you have the death. But glyphosate is incredibly effective at doing this. And what he's saying is, look, when you start depleting the microorganisms in the soil, when you start weakening an immune system, this is not the only thing you're gonna deal with. You're not just gonna kill weeds, you're gonna weaken the plants. He has his field pictures of Gossus wilt in the corn, sudden death syndrome. You can see because it binds the manganese and the magnesium, what are those essential for? Photosynthesis in the plant. If the plant can't do chlorophyll and photosynthesis, you won't see the green. Drive around plants in the Midwest right now and look at the color of the green. The genetically modified crops don't look healthy dark green. They're like a lighter grayish green. It's fascinating to see. So. Let's look at some of the cows that are exposed to this and Kruger from Germany, she's been looking at this and she's showing, wow, we're seeing levels of, of the glyphosate increasing in the cows and it's changing the toxicology markers, the, the uh, markers of kidney function in the actual cows. So you're having problems with the cows and we're showing the manganese and the cobalt are lower. So this isn't just, um, Mr. Don Huber, we're also seeing other people. And oh my gosh, New York Times? This, uh, are you kidding me? September 20th, 2013? Whoa, this is showing misgivings about a weed killer affecting the soil. Mercola wrote about this particular article and he says, look, it's changing the rhizosphere. It's changing what happens in the soil microbiome. It's changing the relationship between the actual roots and the soil. And, and the, the microbiums, uh, microbial organisms in the soil, he's saying this whole ecology is being shifted by the use of this glyphosate. So it's like, wow, you know, uh, yeah, it tightly binds these minerals, but then, you know, it's competing with the plants for the nutrients. So are the plants nutrient insufficient? We need more studies. We need to see what's going on with our food supply right now. We can't, we can't keep looking the other way. So they're more susceptible to parasites and pathogens in the presence, but here's the deal. Here's the solution that the article says, it's amazing. They say, well, if you're gonna kill off the beneficial organisms, 
then we should genetically engineer organisms that can tolerate Roundup. That's the solution, folks. If there's an imbalance, let's get more patenting, let's get more profit from the situation. We can sell now the patented microbes to the farmers because we just killed off all the regular ones. And yes, here's the study, once again, Kruger, showing that the salmonella, the clostridial species, are highly resistant to the glyphosate. And yet the more sensitive enterococcals, uh, lactobacilli, bifido species, are not. So they get killed off. And what do we know about that? We know a lot. We'll, we'll get into that just in a second. But it's also showing that the organisms that produce aflatoxin thrive in the presence of glyphosate. So is it possible that the reason we're getting higher aflatoxin levels in some of our crops due to the glyphosate? That needs to be investigated further. So some of my best friends are germs. If you haven't read this Michael Pollan Tour de Force article, once again, New York Times, I highly suggest it. The guy's a brilliant writer, number one, and he really gets you thinking. We have an entire course in this program on the microbiome, and we're going to break about, up, up, apart what happens at infancy, what happens via you know, C-section, what happens with antibiotic use, and you know we'll, we'll get to these steps here, the 10 to 20 rounds of antibiotics, the drinking water chemicals, the hand sanitizers, the parabens, the that are preservatives and the personal care products, the mercury and vaccinations. We'll talk about the studies showing that each one of these things alters the microbiome, alters the micro environment of organisms that keep us alive and well and train our immune systems to function. We're seeing that now the change of microbiome can lead to a leaky gut. And when you lead to a leaky gut, you can change inflammatory response, which may be behind obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes. You can see dietary antigen exposure. We cover food sensitivities and allergies quite well in this course. And the food sensitivity piece, yes, has a lot to do with intestinal permeability. Once you have a leaky gut, you change everything. And we'll talk about the different things that are being researched, the high fructose corn syrup, the high fat diets, the things that are leading to a leaky gut. And I'll drop a couple bombs too about the high fat diets. It may not be the fat, folks. It may be something in the fat. But man, all the diseases are, are adversely affected. So you change the microbiome, you change your health. Okay, so that's dangerous. But that's okay because the genetically modified crops are going to feed the world, right? Aren't we going to see a lot more crop yields due to genetic modification? Well, this specific analysis by the Union of Concerned Scientists said no. We've looked at more than 20 years of research and we're seeing that no, the intrinsic year of corn and soybean did not did rise, but it was not GE traits. It was the success in traditional breeding, but the transgenic varieties didn't have any yield increase. So that's interesting. So contrary to often repeated claims, okay, we already talked about that one. And here's a slide from Howard Vliger that said, look, I can show you these side-by-side trials. It's a, a yield trial in northwest Iowa. And they found there was a $57.99, so $57.99 less per acre yield. Now, if you look at some of the more drastic effects, some of the pictures from both Howard and Don Huber, you'll see that Roundup Ready soybeans, you can see they look weaker. They look like they can't produce that chlorophyll, that bright green color. They're lacking the magnesium or the manganese. And you can see that little strip of green on the edge where they probably didn't reach it with the sprayer. Missed spraying the second time is what it says. Isn't that fascinating? So then is it possible that when you have this weakness of the plant that the actual yield will be less? And when they did an aerial shot and they calculated the yield from these two farmers, there was a 10 time increase yield from the conventional crops during the drought where the weakened glyphosate applied crops had 10 times less. So it appears, and if you talk to these consultants who are traveling on the United States and you call some of the farmers and you say, hey, is it true they're increasing yields? Listen to the stories. They are fascinating. They will tell you volumes. Here's one in the UK. Farmers are paying extra, but they're getting no better yields than 10 years ago. They're starting to wonder why they're spending the extra money. Now, they're getting resistance to rootworm, and the bugs are now killing the plants, making things sick, so now they're having to use insecticides. So the data's out there, 
the data is out there. We see this field evolved resistant to BT. So you've got rootworm resistance here. The EPA saying, guys, you should really do 20% refuge of non-BT corn so we don't end up with so much resistance. This is such a huge problem. The EPA is saying, come on, let's wake up. So what's our solution, right, as a government? Are we regulating any of this? Or are we actually supporting the, 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 this, this use of, of copious amount of, of chemicals and biotech? Yes, we are. We can see sales rose 24% over the uh, nine months fiscal year. Roundup remains the largest crop protection brand globally. But now there's super weeds and super bugs. And they say, watch this. This article is brilliant. You have to check it out. A new Monsanto growth initiative sprouts up. Just Google that. Read it. It's fascinating. The profits are rising. The bees are suffering. They connect. It's bizarre. The proposed rules would permit crops. And they're talking about how the EPA now, because they can no longer approve a lot of crops because they're way above our past approved levels of Roundup or glyphosate on crops, they're saying, look, we can't even approve the sale of these crops anymore, so we're going to just raise the levels. So now the safety levels from the EPA are increasing. Twice as much glyphosate levels on sesame, flax, soybean, sweet potatoes, and carrots, they'll climb by 15 times and 25 times respectively. So they're allowing for higher levels. Now, American Academy of Environmental Medicine, they've been warning us since 2009. They said, look, we've seen these animal studies way back then before the pig study and the rat study and all these other studies that are starting to come out, they said, look, these are damning studies. We're really scared. We don't really want the general population consuming these items because we don't know what the results are. There are no human trials, folks. None. There are no human trials. And yes, we're, we're eating these every single day. So they said, come on, we're warning you, 2009. Look at some of these places. Go to this test biotech. It's fascinating. It's a group of scientists who said, how in the world did they get by with telling us these were the same crops back in 1992? How in the world? Because there's no way. You have to stop thinking these things are comparable and equivalent, and you really have to be treating them like what they are. They are patented, novel, new organisms. If they weren't patented, novel, and new, they wouldn't be making billions of dollars on them. So you say, okay, why these scientists are saying, come on, this is ridiculous. Here's some of the things you need to do. Investigate toxicity, the impact of these new proteins, whole plant preparations. You need to investigate combinatorial effects between plant compounds, residue spraying, abiotics, biotic factors. So all of the things that we're talking about in this presentation, these scientists are like, duh, why haven't you done this forever ago? So this is interesting. This is... Um, um, Dr. Michael Antonio, who works as a geneticist in um, the UK, and he says, look, this, this is beautiful. I want you to just read it. I'm going to give you the slides, stop this recording, pause it, read this, but it's quite beautiful to say, look, come on, you can't say these are similar. Now, we're, we're spreading these like wildfire. I mean, right now we've got broccoli in the works, we've got RNA silencing apples in the works, we've got the salmon, which I'm going to talk about, we've got all sorts of crops, plums that are on the docket right now. And if we don't stand up and label or demand a change or say, look, precautionary principle, why aren't you treating these like a pharmaceutical? Where are the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials? Where are the human epi uh, epidemiological studies? Where is the data? How are you allowed to sell all these and there's no data? Because you're using my children and my neighbors and my friends and my family as your guinea pigs. So that's interesting. I mean, there's a little bias coming out there. I apologize, but I just say to myself, wait a second, there's enough cause for concern here. We should really be taking more action. So Stephanie Seneff, she's done some comparative analysis. She says, look, here's what happens in the presence of glyphosate. You, you deplete aromatic amino acids and methionine. You disrupt bacterium. You disrupt enzymes for detoxification, vitamin D, cholesterol, sex hormones. You deplete important minerals, likely impair sulfate synthesis. And then she did a comparison between that and autism. And she said, look at this. In autistic kids, I'm part of the Autism Research Institute faculty, so I see this in the children. I see this in the research. Disrupted gut bacterium, inflammatory bowel, low serum sulfate, methionine deficiency, all the things you see in the presence of 
the use of increased glyphosate. So a physicist who lives here locally, 15 minutes from my house, Nancy Swanson, started doing statistical analysis. She did statistical analysis on the increased use of glyphosate and the increase of autism, and she found a correlation coefficient of 0.985. The tightest you can get is one. So this is fascinating because we're told, look, they're safe. The chemicals are safe. The GMOs are safe. We have not seen a drastic increase of diseases due to these things. There's no correlation. How do we know if there's a correlation? We haven't labeled them, so we don't know if you're consuming or if they're causing the illness. But there's no correlation. It doesn't exist, right? Well, she's doing the correlation coefficients on numerous diseases, and they're fascinating, folks. Hospital discharge, inflammatory bowel, acres of planted of GM um, BT corn, deaths due to intestinal infection associated with acres planted in the millions of BT corn, obesity in U.S. population, percent GE corn and soy, glyphosate applied, corn and soy. So, hello, do you see the spikes? Do you see in 1996 plus there are spikes in all these diseases and disorders? We're on to prevalence of diabetes here. And we're seeing these spikes. Okay, now we're on to incidence diabetes versus prevalence. And we're seeing spikes. So what's going on? Well, you, you have to start thinking, where is this all coming from? Like, where are the profits? Where's the, the, where's the motivation? Like, why? Why is this happening? If there's risk, why isn't it being withdrawn? Really, we have so many of our crops, folks, over 90% of corn, soy, cottonseed, canola. Uh, you know, the sugar beets, now we're moving up in alfalfa, we have Hawaiian papaya, all these things that are genetically modified. If we overnight said these are dangerous, we need to withdraw these from the market, there'd be an economic collapse. It is dangerous for them right now to consider this. So why wouldn't there be a massive investment? We're up to $17 million invested so far in the vote no on I-522 campaign. <laughs> Plug in I-522 anywhere on the internet and uh, start blogging about it and watch who shows up on your blog post, your Facebook post, your Twitter. There will be a troll. I can almost guarantee you it happens every time we do it. And then you will also get, interestingly enough, you'll get a little ad <laughs> that pops up on the top of the page. It says, facts on I-522, which is a no for 522 campaign. So. They're saying the science says these are completely and totally safe. How can it? They've never investigated long-term animal trials. They've never done any human trials. And what we see in the literature is, in a study involving 94 articles selected through objective criteria, it was found that the existence of either financial or professional conflict of interest was associated to study outcomes that cast genetically modified products in a favorable light. 0.005. Do you need any greater statistical significance? While financial conflict of interest alone did not correlate, a strong association was found between author affiliation to industry and study outcome. Oh, yeah, there is greater statistical significance, a 0.001. So you start saying to yourself, is there really science? Who is this pseudoscientist? Is it the person who's saying, I have some precautionary principle I'd like to honor because I see some of these anomalies here that are showing up with changes in the health of animals. I'm seeing these toxins showing up in pregnant women and unborn offspring. I would like to, at the very least, label, at the very most, ban these things until proper science is done, until we know the exact effect on humans. So you know what? There hasn't been an increased yield. There has been a massive increased use of chemicals. And there has not been an increase of nutrient density or quality of the crops that are primarily used in the United States. So this is the one thing the biotech industry is resting on. It's the golden rice. They wanted to have beta carotene added into rice so you would not get blindness in places where there's lots of diarrhea, dysentery. So India, for example, a lot of kids have chronic diarrhea, they have an issue with vitamin A, so they give you beta carotene in the rice by genetic modification, although it's never been approved yet. So did you hear about this? Apparently, the United States was sponsoring a trial, branches of the United States government sponsoring a trial in China where they are giving golden rice 
to children in China without telling them it was genetically modified. They got fined. They got told, this is unethical. What in the world are you doing? There's an urgency to get this on the market as fast as possible, to get it approved as fast as possible, because this would be a quote-unquote saving grace. We could actually say, here is a benefit of genetically modified crops other than increasing the bottom line of your profits. We actually have something that improves the life of the consumer, which would be increased beta-carotene content. But they're going through unethical measures to get this approved. Now, I'm just going to throw a few little snippets out. We've got to close here. We're going to throw out a little snippet that says, did you know there are human DNA in rice in Kansas? Yeah, there's a rice that's out there that's making a lactoferrin that's uh, pretty pretty uh, interesting. We talked about how the gene can transfer horizontally into the bacterium. That might be scary. MicroRNA, this is a whole other science. Look into this. Plants, microRNA will incorporate into our own, own RNA pools and affect our behavior and our health. Well, check this out. It's pretty fascinating. But what happens when you start messing around with natural RNA? What starts when you start messing around with the DNA of a plant? What's going to be the outcome? Are we going to end up with new species of microRNA that we have no idea the outcome? It would be interesting. Here's another thing. This is kind of troubling. Read this article. There's another class, Rapid Transit Development System, or Oligonucleotide-Directed Mutagenesis, which is actually mutating DNA, but not being classified as genetically modified. It's been in our marketplace for an extended period of time, folks, but nobody knows about it. So check into that. That's pretty fascinating. And here's a problem, too. Once the genie's out of the bottle, or in this case, the gene is out of the bottle, What's going to happen? We had some trials for genetically modified wheat way back in the day, and we are now finding these same traits in Oregon wheat this year? So this cross-contamination of genes can occur readily via pollination. What happens when we get into the salmon? We're a couple of months away from this, by the way. We have a 24-inch, 6.6-pound genetically modified salmon versus a 13-inch, 2.8-pound non-GM salmon. These are tremendously larger salmon that are quite aggressive when they get hungry. There have been studies to show that if they escape into the wild, we're going to have troubles. In fact, they talked about hybridization between the modified salmon with wild brown trout. And they said, look at this. They're closely enough related that transgenic hybrids appear to express competitive dominance and suppress the growth of transgenic and non-transgenic wild salmon by 82 and 54 percent respectively. Empirical evidence of the first steps towards introgression of foreign transgenes into the genomes of new species and contribute to the growing evidence that transgenic animals have complex and, con and context-specific interactions with wild populations. So they're basically saying, dude, you can wipe out wild salmon and wild brown trout if these intermingled if they bred you could have these aggressive now trout that could take out the populations as well so what's the solution tons go to the non-gmo shoppingguide.com there's an application there's a shopping guide pass it on to all your clients your patients give them the information they need if they'd like to avoid gm crops the reality is there's so much cross-contamination of GM genes right now that they're estimating that corn for sure would likely have cross-contamination. So in other words, they can never guarantee an organic corn from now on out to be 100% pure. We're moving in that direction for canola. We're moving in that direction for sugar beets. And we're moving in that direction for soy. So once the gene is out of the bottle, it's really hard to, to, to uh, regulate at all. Possible hidden GMO ingredients. Here they are. There's more on our website. There's more in Genetic Roulette. If you haven't watched that movie, Genetic Roulette, that's probably one of the biggest game changers. One of the best things you can do is just sit somebody down in front of a movie screen, hand them the DVD and say, watch this, please. I love you. I care about you. And I care about our future generations. We need to make a move now and watch what happens. It's a game changer. Now, 64 of the countries already labeled GMOs. 
We're, we're on the docket right now, I-522. If you want to support the labeling of GMO foods in Washington State, this is a game changer. The globe is watching us now. If we stamp this out in Washington State and say, no, we're going to label, we're not going to buy into your propaganda campaign about attacking the actual initiative and not addressing the fact that there's a risk associated with these foods. You know, you can get on the phone, you can talk to people here in Washington State and convince them. You can share whatever resources, experiences, case studies you have, and you can convince them. So go to yes522.com. This is Don Huber's quote. I love it. Future historians may well look back and write about our time, not about how many pounds of pesticide we did or did not apply, but about how willing we are to sacrifice our children and jeopardize future generations with this massive experiment that is based on false promises and flawed science, just to benefit the bottom line of a commercial enterprise. Ah, oh, that's a heavy burden. I can't carry that burden. I can't carry it alone, and I can't sit by and watch this happen. That's why you're watching this webinar now. That's why I'm going to share my references. I'm going to share my slides, whatever you need, my MP3, you got it. If you want to see the political environment that allowed GMOs to happen in the United States, this is a beautiful article written by Dave Murphy. You'll see the links on either side. Cut them, paste them, put them into your computer, read this article, or do a Google search for the title. It's fascinating. It showed how George Bush Sr. was actually quite uh, open to deregulating the political environment to allow for biotech to flourish. They formed an actual position within the FDA to allow for Michael Taylor, who is an ex-Monsanto lawyer, to write the policies for genetically modified foods for the United States. Read this article. It will blow your mind. Watch the video where you can see George Bush, George H.W. Bush, talking to Monsanto executives who are worried about the approval process, and he says, call me. We're in the D-reg, like deregulatory business. Maybe we can help. Watch that video. It'll blow your mind. So I'm going to close on this. If animals who are in touch with all their senses, their taste, their sight, their smell, their hearing, if they sense something about GM crops and will not touch them, these are some Howard slides. He says, look, these are some, some crop bags that the mice got into. You can see the non-GMO on the right, the GMO on the left. Mice wouldn't touch the GMO. Why not? Same thing happens with squirrels. You leave those out. Nine months later, it's not touched. So we're seeing numerous animals will not eat this voluntarily. Why are we eating it? That's an interesting question. Until it's proven safe, we need human trials. So here, <laughs> here's what's happening on these propositions and now in Initiative 522. The no campaigns will not take on the argument of risk. They can't because they know there's risk. They know they've never been proven safe. So if you look at these battles, they're all on the initiatives or the propositions. Look at the no side. Read the yes. It's so simple. We want a label. Read the no. Look at the con down below. Prop 37 is a deceptive, deeply flawed food labeling scheme full of special interest exemptions and loopholes. Prop 37 would create new government bureaucracy costing taxpayer a million, authorize expensive shakedown lawsuits against farmers and small business, and increase family grocery bills by hundreds of dollars per year. You know what? Who wrote that, right? If it had to be a lawyer or a PR campaign, or probably both. Probably got a PR campaign to write it, lawyer to prove it. Look what's going on here, folks. Where's the mentioning about safety? health, nutrient quality. Where's any of that? It doesn't exist. This is all about the proposition. They're going to spin it. They're going to create doubt in your mind that this shouldn't be voted on because of how it's written, because it's going to cost you more money. More money. For labeling? Come on. I've worked in the industry. We've labeled new products. You take a label batch. You reprint it. You run out of those original labels, and then you run the new batch. It doesn't cost you much at all. If all these things were going to happen, why haven't they happened in Europe? When we do gluten-free labeling, when we've done allergy labeling, have we really end up with millions of dollars of more money for taxpayers? No. These arguments are ridiculous. They're trying to feed, wash out, feed on your fear, feed on your doubt. Do you know why? 
They did this with cigarettes. They do this with climate change. When you doubt something, you can't jump in 100%. You'll think to yourself, well, I'm too busy. I'm not really, well, you know what? There's probably something there, but I'm not sure. In fact, that's enough doubt for me to just pull out of this situation altogether. You can't. You can't right now. If you do, your food supply will have enviro pigs in it. There will be genetically modified cattle in it. You will have genetically modified salmon, apples, broccoli, plums. You name the fruit or vegetable that you normally consume agriculturally. And if there's a profit to be made, it's on the docket to be genetically modified. We don't know the risks. And yet, it's going forward full steam ahead. It's time to take a stand. It's time to take a stand now. Think to yourself in the next 30 days, what's the most important use of your time? Is it shuffling through paperwork? Is it playing Angry Birds? Is it whatever it is? Could your action, shifting the vote of one or two or three or five people, could it be any more important? We're talking about the future of this planet and our food supply. So I urge you, check it out. This is a beautiful Facebook post my friend is posting all the time. This is Stephen Trinkhouse from Terra Organica. He labels every item in his store that could be genetically modified. And he wrote a really nice post on Initiative 522 where he just dove into the entirety of all the quote unquote science on the no on I-522 and said there's nothing there. I looked, I challenge you to look and see what you come up with. It's time. It's time. Now is the time. So let's take action. And you know, if you join me in this Progressive Practitioner Coaching Program, also, we're going to take action on a lot of different things. We're going to look at food nutrient density. We're going to look at detoxification capacity. We're going to look at your skincare products. We're going to look at things that are in the air, in the water. And we're going to alter the path of health for hopefully hundreds, if not thousands of people who walk through the door of your office or clinic. That's why we're here. Share the information. Let's get educated and let's get people better. We deserve to be happy and healthy. Let's go out and get it. All right. Thanks so much, gang. You have a great night and we'll talk to you all soon.